venerable religious and dear parishioners, I would like to speak about our Blessed Mother in today's sermon. And how can we not talk about Our Lady since we are in Christmas time? Take our Blessed Mother out of the Christmas picture, how can you even have an infant Jesus? Well, of course, with God, all things are possible. He could have sent his son miraculously, but it would have raised the most, you know, difficult questions. Where did this child come from? And every child has a, has a father and a mother. And we know that Jesus could not have a human father, although to all appearances at first, anyway, St. Joseph was his father. He was obviously only as a, his stepfather or father of adoption. But he did have a true human mother. And so we do very well to honor Our Lady, to recognize the immense role that God has given to her. It's beyond our comprehension. It's not infinite, but it's beyond our comprehension. And just as, and the fathers of the church say this over and over again, just as Eve cooperated in the ruination of the human race, so too God wanted a woman to cooperate in the salvation, in the redemption of the human race. And so God chose to be born, as St. Paul says, he was born of a woman. St. Paul was inspired, put that in there. He came through Mary. We need not be afraid of honoring Our Lady too much. Why? Because we can't possibly begin to honor her as much as Jesus has. How much has our Lord honored his mother? Well, just the very fact that he made her his mother... God can do that, you see. We can, nobody else can. By the very fact that he made her his mother necessarily means that she is the most dignified human being of all time. The one with the greatest dignity. By that very fact, she's also queen of heaven and earth. In the Old Testament, remember, it was not the wife of the king that was the queen. That's the way it is in the New Testament and in, in the more in the last couple thousand years. But in the Old Testament, it was the mother of the king that was the queen. So it fit in very well with the Jewish understanding of how royalty works. If Jesus, in, well, in fact, he is the king of kings, so his mother, by that very fact, is the queen of all. He made her immaculate. And as the church also teaches, he made her the dis distributor of all of his graces. She's the mediatrix of all graces. So how can any human being come close to that kind of honor that Jesus has given to his mother? He honored her with his obedience. He's almighty God. And yet he obeys her. Not just when he's young. And in today's, well, today's gospel actually jumps ahead 40 days to, to the purifications. But the church puts this gospel in. And remember, well, actually we'll hear this on Holy Family Sunday. That he went down to Nazareth and was subject to them. Almighty God obeying his own creatures. Granted, they are the most perfect of his human creatures. Mary is perfect. St. Joseph, very, very holy. And he's obeying them, but they're still his creatures. What an example to us. When we struggle with obedience to God, how can we ever come close to the obedience that Christ practiced himself? So, again, 
be, don't be afraid of honoring Mary too much. And this is something that St. Louis B. de Montfort brings out so beautifully in his book, True Devotion to Mary, and it's really a wonderful logic where he earnestly recommends that one renews his baptismal vows through Mary. Because who knows Jesus better than his mother? Nobody. In our struggle to become more like Christ, why? Because we have a fallen nature and the devil is working up against us and the world is working against us. So it's going to be a real struggle. But why not go to her who knows him best, the one who is his own mother, the one who was called upon to raise him, even though he didn't need any raising, strictly speaking, but he allowed himself to be raised as a, as a, to all appearance as a normal child. He's like, us, like to us in all things except for sin, St. Paul says. Go to her and trust yourself to her. St. Louis Marie de Montfort calls it total consecration. He also calls it holy slavery. But even in his time, this is the early 1700s, he's keenly aware of this horrible problem of slavery. And this is something that had to go away, this horrible treatment of human beings. Nobody has the right to own another human being. So St. Louis is conscious of that, and I, I really appreciate how in True Devotion to Mary, he says, if you don't want to call it holy slavery, that's all right, because you're a child. So it's really the same thing, and I find the perfect biblical explanation of this in the first line of today's epistle. Brethren, as long as the heir is a child, he differs in no way from a slave. So St. Paul is explaining that dependence that both the child has and the slave has on the, on the master. Again, a word that's very fraught with 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 difficulty and, and terrible memory. So again, if you if somebody chooses not to say that, talk about holy childhood. So this is what it is to make ourselves dependent on Our Lady. This is what total consecration to Jesus through Mary is. Now you can't get to heaven without a great devotion to Mary. That's that's doctrine. That's part of our Catholic faith. And as I said earlier, how can we honor our lady as much as our Lord himself has honored her? We can't. So, but not everybody, you're not required to make the act of total consecration, but so highly encouraged because you're entrusting yourself to our lady. And here's the point, just like Jesus entrusted himself to Mary. How can you go wrong? You can't. You're, you're imitating Christ in such a special way. So again, that's the beautiful logic of total consecration to Jesus through Mary. I want to share with you also an explanation of Our Lady as the Ark of the Covenant. By the way, I've, we've talked about this in theology class with the high school students, something I really enjoy to explain this marvelous connection between the Old Testament and the New, one of the many, and again, the New Testament fulfills the Old. So some of this will sound like class, I mean, if my high school students, or theology students are here. But anyway, you've heard that saying, Ark of the Covenant. It's in the litany of Our Lady. And I want to explain to you the biblical basis for this. This is one of my favorite titles of Our Lady, the Ark of the Covenant. In the Old Testament, the most precious thing people had was something they couldn't even see. As a matter of fact, no priest could even see the Ark of the Covenant because it was in the Holy of Holies and only the high priest once a year could go in there on the Day of Atonement, on the Yom Kippur, as you say it in Hebrew. 
It was so sacred. It was so holy. And in the Ark of the Covenant, which God had specifically designed, you read about it in Exodus, how God say, said what the dimension should be, what the material should be, how it should be all covered with gold. He called it the mercy seat. His special presence would be upon this. It wasn't his physical. It wasn't a physical thing like the Holy Eucharist, of course, which is even more sacred. But it was something, a special presence of God. And inside the Ark of the Covenant were three things. The tablets of the law, which Moses received on Mount Sinai. The rod of Aaron, which signifies priesthood. He was the high priest. And a pot of manna, that miraculous food that rained down from heaven every day, except on the Sabbath, for the Jewish people and the in their wanderings during the Exodus, the 40 years of wandering in the desert. So that was the most sacred thing they had. And you remember how when it was being carried from uh, from a, a temporary place to finally be put in Solomon's tem- temple, somebody had reached out, at, one of the ox cart drivers had reached out his hand to steady it because he was in danger of falling. He was struck dead. It was that sacred. Nobody could touch it except for those specifically designated, the Levites, the priests of the Levi, among the Levites. So this is what they had. Now, when Jerusalem was destroyed... As part of the Babylonian captivity, the Ark of the Covenant disappeared. The temple was completely destroyed. We're told the prophet Jeremiah hid the Ark of the Covenant. And when the temple was rebuilt, when the people came back from captivity, this was over 500 years before Christ, the Ark of the Covenant never appeared again. And the Holy of Holies that was built, it was just now an empty room. No Ark of the Covenant. It was gone. As far as, from, I feel I can safely say, gone forever. Does it exist somewhere? Maybe. But it's not meant to come to public light again because Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant. Let me just show you some biblical passages. In Exodus, we're told, chapter 40, God the Holy Ghost overshadowed and then indwelled the Ark. The Ark became the dwelling place of the presence of God. The angel Gabriel says, the Holy Ghost will overshadow thee. The same exact word, overshadow And now Jesus indwells Our Lady. Overshadow, indwell. You see how the Old Testament prefigures the new. The ark contained the Ten Commandments, a pot of manna, and Aaron's, the high priest Aaron's rod. The womb of the virgin contained Jesus, the living word of God. The law of God, you might say, in human flesh now. The manna represented the Holy Eucharist, the human flesh of Jesus. Holy communion is called the divine manna. The ark traveled, we read about this in second, uh, or the second book of Kings, the ark traveled to the hill country of Judah to rest in the house of Obededom. Mary, the Ark of the Covenant, traveled to the hill country of Judah to the home of Elizabeth. Traveling in the same place, the old Ark of the Covenant, the new Ark of the Covenant. Dressed in a priestly ephod, King David danced and leapt for joy in that procession. Again, second book of Kings. St. John the Baptist leapt for joy in his mother's womb when the Ark of the Covenant came near. St. Elizabeth said, as soon as the sound of thy greeting came to my ears, the babe in my womb leapt for joy. 
Do you see these unmistakable parallels? I should even say fulfillments of Old Testament prefigurements. David asked, how is it that the ark of the Lord comes to me? In second book of Kings, Elizabeth asks, how is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? The ark remained in the house of Obedidim for three months. Mary stayed for three months. The ark of the covenant of the New Testament stayed for three months helping her cousin Elizabeth. The charity of Our Lady, her willingness to help. What an inspiration for us. We fail so we can fail so readily in charity, not being willing to help like our Blessed Mother did. The house of Obedidim was blessed by the presence of the ark. In Luke chapter 1, Our Lady is, the word blessed is used three times to describe Our Lady. The ark returned to its sanctuary and eventually ends up in Jerusalem. In the newly built temple of, of Solomon, Mary returned home from visiting Elizabeth and eventually comes to Jerusalem where she presents God the Son in the temple, of course, the rebuilt temple, not the temple of Solomon. But again, unmistakable parallels. When the ark was outside the Holy of Holies, it was to be covered in a blue veil. We read this in the book of Numbers, chapter 4. And think of how many times in Mary's appearances she wears a blue veil. So much Catholic art shows her wearing the blue veil. In the Apocalypse, St. John sees the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. That's in chapter 11. In the following chapter, chapter 12, John sees Mary in heaven, the woman clothed with the sun. So I just wanted to share this with you to help you in your devotion to Our Lady. And one of the very beautiful titles we can call her is the Ark of the Covenant. We never need to find again if, or to see the Ark of the Old Covenant, but we most certainly need to honor and love the living, perso- true person, Ark of the New Covenant, our Blessed Mother. She is the short, sure, and easy way to Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.